Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this interesting panel. The title of this panel is Peace in Pieces. New pathways for UN that works. You know, some of the sound bites which I heard are not very encouraging to be diplomatic. You know, let me list a few of them. We talked a lot about inequity, about the lack of consistency, about some problems which uh, are more important than others. We talked about the global north against global south, about the west against the rest, about the mistrust in the international community. So it's safe to say that, uh, you know, we are not as in Ghana would say, we are not in a good place. The world is not in a good place. And I have with me uh, five panelists who will try to see and who will try to explain why we are where we are, and more importantly, how do we get from this hole that we dug up, as always, uh, in the history of humankind by ourselves. So, uh, with this, uh, let me jump right into the session, and I will start with the Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of uh, Slovenia, Tanja Fajon. Tanja, um, you know, Slovenia is a candidate country for the UN Security Council. You are, the vote is in June, hopefully you will get in. Uh, and in the last, you know, in the last months, in the last uh, year, I would say, you are, you have been very busy. I know that because uh, I was following uh, you sometimes around. You went to a lot of conferences, a lot of bilateral meetings, a lot of uh, discussions with uh, your fellow counterparts. Um, and I know that you don't like, you don't like just to hear, you like to listen also. Um, so what is your take from these discussions? I mean, what did you hear? What did you learn? Thank you, Peter. It's uh, an amazing to see how many people um, are this Saturday morning in the room and prepared to listen to us in the very complex topic that we are discussing, but a very timely one. Um, you're right saying that um, maybe you see that I'm pretty much tired since I am many weeks and months on, on the way, but um, we are a small country, Slovenia. We have two million inhabitants. So for us, it's extremely important to understand what's going on around the world, not just on the European continent, but to understand where are like-minded countries, where can we have our partners, what is happening with the conflicts that are all around the globe. Um, I think in the last few months I visited all the continents more or less. I had a chance to speak uh, with many different partners. What is interesting to see that no matter where on which side of the globe you are, you can find so many things in common, maybe just seen from a bit different perspective. And as you rightly said, I think we are today more connected than ever before, but at the same time, most fragmented and the world became extremely complex as pieces everywhere around. And in this very complex world, I think it's extremely important we listen to each other more than ever before, and not only listen, we have to hear each other and understand each other. Because yes, sometimes I hear when I'm speaking with my colleagues um, in Europe, of course we are affected um, with a brutal war in Ukraine and um, it affects us all. But at the same time, I'm very much aware that there are other conflicts and wars around the globe, that it's same happening elsewhere. And this criticism that I sometimes hear the West against the rest, or you are behaving ignorant, you're not humble enough. I can say yes to some extent. We shall not behave as being ignorant. We have to be humble and be capable of embrace Global South. 
because we need each other. Um, if we have a, a today, whenever I speak with my colleagues, be it everywhere around the world, usually comes there is one thing where we all have the same challenge, and this is climate change. Climate change, the environment, what is affecting our world. You can just see you have three big continents, China, US, and EU, which are globally consuming one half of global energy and producing 40% of green gas emissions. So these three continents have to work together to reduce you know, global warming, to limit global warming, to do much better in protecting our environment for the other parts of the world that are most affected, like Africa, like small islands, Caribbean, Pacifics, that some are really in danger to disappear. So what I want to say is that being someone that runs for the Security Council, which is, I think, the basic of securing peace and world order and multilateralism is at the heart of our policy. When you come from small country, you cannot have much more to offer than be an honest broker, be capable of listening and building the bridges. We don't have much to owe to anyone. But we have to understand that multilateralism is based on principles of a UN charter, of human rights, and of a respect and trust. And this is what um, I try to, to do, and uh, honestly, I strongly believe in the principles of um, international law, because if we break that, and if we lose that, I think it's a beginning of, um, of era that everything will be possible. Everything will be possible and people will suffer. They're suffering already at many parts of the world. So it's our responsibility as politicians, and not only as politicians, as businessmen, as a civil society, as academia, to work together, to have a full picture of what is going around the world, and really to try to address all these big global challenges that are not challenges of one small country or one big continent, but are global challenges for all of us. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for that. Let me now turn to uh, Minister for Information of Ghana. As we said at the beginning, you know, when uh, the world suffers, Africa suffers the most. And, um, you know, we heard a lot in the last couple of days about uh, Africa, about uh, you know the challenges that uh, you are facing, also because of the uh, war in Ukraine, food security, um, economic downfalls, the debt that is uh, getting bigger and bigger. And Africa, it seems that uh, is tired of waiting for the international community to actually step up, especially uh, the most advanced countries and to really help you uh, to go on a much more faster path toward uh, development. Tell me a little bit uh, uh, more about this, Minister, about Africa's uh, positions in terms of multilateralism, in terms of how it should look like and why it's not working uh, today for Africa. Thanks for the opportunity and um, uh, I think it's uh, a good platform for us to articulate some of the, the views that Africa has on these issues that you raise. Uh, as you rightly mentioned, in the last couple of days, there's been a lot of talk about the impact of some of these global developments on Africa. Um, in particular, the recent challenges of the pandemic and the Black Sea uh, War have hit us very, very hard. Uh, many of our economies are fragile, many of our democracies are fragile and are now, uh, you know, on a rebound uh, about, in Ghana, for example, about 30 years of uninterrupted democracy and we're working to, uh, you know, build a more resilient state uh, following from there. But what these crises have done to Africa in particular is that it's escalated the cost of living. Uh, it has made economic conditions very, very difficult for many of our people. And a good number of African economies are having to struggle with a debt burden because of the challenges that economies went through uh, in uh, recent years. And our expectation is that the global multilateral platforms um, would 
come in handy in the resolution efforts. First, of the substantive issues that have you know, impacted us, and then secondly, uh, in terms of the impact. Uh, it's a bit unfortunate that today's multilateral institutions like the uh, United Nations and the UN Security Council that are supposed to help um, prevent some of these challenges on the global stage or respond a bit more adequately. In terms of the uh, architecture, uh, are lagging behind um, today. If you look at the United Nations Security Council and, and the entire UN construct from the 1945s, as compared to today, the kind of issues that it was designed to deal with, uh, the kind of global ecosystem at the time, it's very different from today or marginally different from today. And it therefore requires some sort of reforms that will enable multilateral institutions like that to better respond to the contemporary challenges that the world is going through, which are uh, you know, affecting uh, countries on our continent uh, very severely. And even if you go beyond the uh, you know, United Nations itself, if you look at the global economic institutions and how they were designed on the back of the Second World War, um, primarily to help in the reconstruction of Europe and uh, you know, some, some, some other geographic areas, there needs to be a fine tuning to get them to better respond to uh, some other parts of the world, the global south, uh, you know, uh, uh, Africa, for example. Uh, for example, today Ghana is uh, uh, in a debt restructuring exercise that requires some more response from the uh, you know, global community, the Paris Club, China, a few other places. And if you look at the current architecture of the multilateral institutions to be able to quickly respond to that, we could do with um, a bit more help. So multilateral institutions generally are things that we are pleased to be part of, but we're of the view that in contemporary times, some reforms are needed to better position them to respond to the challenges of today, particularly as they affect Africa. Thank you, Minister. Um, let's stay a little bit more about, uh, in, the, in the context of the reform of the Security Council. Uh, with us, we have uh, Lakshmi Puri, who was uh, UN Assistant uh, Secretary General and uh, also Deputy Executive of the UN Women. Uh, Lakshmi, um, you know, this reform, uh, it seems that we always are going about it uh, half heartedly or not seriously. You know, and I hate it uh, the most when politicians. Uh, use this phrase that uh, every crisis is an opportunity. I don't know opportunity for yeah. whom, but uh, definitely uh, this crisis period that we are going through, you know, with the pandemics, with the energy crisis, with the war in Ukraine, um, has shifted a little bit uh, the whole narrative. You know, it seems that people are taking, or the countries are taking, uh, things uh, more seriously and more serious discussions are coming about. Um, what's the Indian view about this? You know, you embarked on this new India project under the Modi government. You seem more ass assertive, more confident. Um, how is this going to help uh, to better the multilateral system? I think it's very, very important to recognize that as the theme of this panel very rightly highlights that today we are facing an existential crisis in the areas of peace, but also other areas. And um, the last UN at 75 for the last three years onwards uh, has been in the throes of a crisis itself. Uh, a crisis of relevance, a crisis of, and in the context of peace, I think that has become now the big um, urgent issue that has to be addressed. We need, there is, it's, it's no question whether it's a war of choice or a war of necessity, member states themselves will not make good peace. So you need a supranational body like the UN, which has only stake in peace, to come forward 
and be impartial, be empowered, be also well equipped to be able to deliver on the global public good of peace and security. So, but in order to do that, the three UNs, the governments, the secretariat, and we, the people, have to come together. And in that context, I think the UN Security Council, which is the engine, which is the apex body, you can call it the control tower, the war room, whatever it is, that has to be completely restructured and reformed. Otherwise, we have peace in pieces as we have right now. And the, that U UN reform, UN Security Council reform, must, 30, 30 years we have been looking at the question of equitable uh, um, representation. We are been looking at expansion. Entire continents are not represented. Africa, Latin America, five billion people are not represented in the Security Council. So you have a P5, which now we, in the context of a riven world of, of the Cold War, 2.0, we have that kind of a managed mm -hmm. uh, Security Council, which is trying to run the business of peace and security cooperation. So that's not going to work. And the urgency of therefore reforming expansion of permanent and non-permanent members of also the very important, the working methods, codifying it, having, because a lot of things happen informally and then they don't happen because they are informed. The secretariat support, how secretariat can be enabled and also budgetary support and, uh, you know, a lot of functions of the Security Council. And I would like to also later talk about counterterrorism. But many bodies are being uh, funded through extra budgetary resources. We have to have stable funding so that the agenda and the operations of the UN ha are uh, demand driven you know, by the needs. I mean, in the Africa context, I think you know what I mean. The regional institutions have to be empowered, developed, and again, African Union is a case in point, how that can be uh, better uh, included into this whole, uh, the, in the UN Security Council's uh, operations. Then also the question of uh, how do you include uh, the the, uh, the issues of, um, you know, I've already said demand-driven aspects, but also how do we bring together uh, a, a better coordination with the UNGA and the relationship with the UNGA has to be redefined in some way because that is the more democratic body and it must be better aligned. So my point is that we need uh, to have a major uh, rethink, exertion of political will and the international community. And the big shocks have come now yeah. in the form of COVID and, and in the form of uh, the Ukraine, um, uh, uh, Russia war. So in that context, I think it's really important and that's why India has put forward this whole idea of the new orientation uh, for a reformed multilateralism norm. Uh, and we are going to be working towards, I believe, uh, um, the um, common, uh, uh, the uh, summit of for a future for for yeah. the future uh, in 2024, and a new agenda for peace. Yeah. But a new agenda will be nothing if we don't have a new structure, a new governance uh, mechanism, which is uh, represented uh, by the rest of the world. And Lakshmi, not uh, thank you. Just a quick question, because I see the, the minutes ticking away. 
Uh, you rightly said, uh, in terms of the Security Council reform, the problem is we don't have a time frame and we don't have a document. Exactly. Do you think, do you think it's possible that we are so, going to arrive to this? No, absolutely. It has to be text-based. It has to be transparently negotiated. And also this chicken and egg thing of let's negotiate first uh, to get a consensus uh, and then we'll negotiate the text later. I mean, we have to get going with building the consensus on the basis of a text, yeah. negotiating a text. So it has to be time bound. And I think this 2024 is a big opportunity where we not launch the negotiations, but we undertake the ne negotiations in 2023 and then go forward and launch it in 2024. The new mechanism, the new structure, it is not ambitious. It is uh, you know, it is really overdue, urgent, and doable. Because, as they say, you know, in the meantime, time is mean. Uh, Armenia, we have with us uh, Deputy uh, Minister, Mr. Safrian. You know, Armenia knows a lot about uh, forgotten conflict. It knows a lot about international community looking away, dealing with uh, other subjects, you know, uh, sometimes international community seems like uh, men who can't do uh, many things at the same time. Um, your minister mentioned in the context of the Security Council that the new multilateralism should be based on the lessons learned. Um, you know, it seems to me that either we skip some lessons or that uh, we are very bad pupils uh, because we didn't uh, learn a lot. What's Armenia's uh, position on uh, how to move forward from the place that we are standing in right now? We have been uh, one of the countries that were caught in this storm in the international system. And um, I completely agree with the view that small countries like, like us should be um, honest participants of the international system and uh, Armenia has always been uh, very hopeful that uh, multilaterals will work all uh, all along from the day that we became uh, independent and a member of United Nations and uh, 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 we have been uh, experiencing these negative consequences of um, the failure of international system and uh, after the war of aggression uh, uh, by our neighbor Azerbaijan against Nagorno-Karabakh, against Armenia's territory, we had this uh, feeling that uh, the international system is failing. Um, uh, but um, we are still full of hope and we uh, negotiate with our neighbor in uh, uh, um, good faith. Uh, uh, there is a peace agreement that we are negotiating with the participation of uh, uh, our uh, pa partners in, in Europe and elsewhere. And um, uh, we hope that um, the UN system can play a, a bigger role in this. Uh, we cannot fulfill this uh, task without UN role. And um, uh, recently, uh, a ruling by International Court of Justice um, uh, requesting Azerbaijan to open the Lachin uh, corridor for free movement of people and transport was uh, has uh, given us um, another an, another you know opportunity and hope to 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 engage the international system in this but, process. But do you um, think that uh, international community is uh, supporting you enough, or that sh there should be more support from? Uh, the biggest actors in uh, in international community. I mean, also in terms of UN, because you, you rightly said, and I think also Kojo mentioned it, UN right now is basically paralyzed. It's not working, especially the Security Council, because of all the all the things that are right now on the table. Well, um, uh, it's it's always uh, more place for such role, and uh, one of our. Uh, um, hopes is also that countries like India, for example, play a greater role. And uh, this is why we are also a frequent participant in this uh, excellent platform. Yeah. Thank you. And now I turn to Ivan Korchok, who is uh, 
a seasoned diplomat and a former foreign minister of Slovakia. Now you heard all the other panelists more or less describing how the state of affairs is uh, right now. You have been also ambassador in Washington, in Brussels. Um, this notion West against the rest, uh, this notion Global North uh, not helping enough the Global South or not understanding enough the problems of uh, Global South. Is this perception true? Is it valid in your opinion? I mean, is Africa, as Korto was mentioning, right? Uh, in saying that uh, there is inconsistency of uh, actions and uh, views in the international community. What would you say? First of all, uh, many thanks for having me here and congratulations to organizers on this uh, excellent uh, forum. I will respond to your question by sharing one uh, short episode from the last year Globsec Forum. Globsec Forum is a partner forum of Raisina, you see its logo here, uh, down on the panel. And when I was minister last year, I managed to invite and get um, Minister Jaikan Sharp participating there. And it was three, four months after the uh, Russian Federation invaded Ukraine, and the moderator has pressed him, my distinguished colleague Jaikan Shar, asking him to take a position uh, on that on behalf of India. And that was an interesting ex exchange. And at the end of the day, he, he made a bold statement which has resonated well beyond uh, that forum. And he said that uh, this war in or against uh, Ukraine should be for us Europeans a wake-up call while we should stop believing that our European problems are the world's problems while we have demonstrated so many times in the past that the world's problems have not been perceived by us, by Europeans, as our problems. This resonates a lot, and this is a link, in a way, to your question that you're posing, uh, that, that you have uh, asked me, whether, whether this is West against the rest. It could be. But I don't like especially the word against, because if you look just at what we are witnessing, namely a watershed moment in European security architecture system. It is challenged, it is destroyed by, by, this, uh, by this aggression. Um, we see that the opposite is happening to what we are committed to as international uh, community, namely to preserving peace. And if I paraphrase the title from, from the panel, Peace in Pieces, then I dare say that all pieces are in place and still this war is happening. In other words, I'm asking, my question, I'm asking myself very often, even if, for example, United Nations Security Council would have been reformed before, would this war or could this war have been avoided? We have everything in place. We have binding international law, we have UN Charter, we have humanitarian law, we have pro prohibition of use of force, and you can continue. And still it is happening. So one piece is missing, namely a responsible behavior, a behavior which respects the very rules uh, that create or represent the foundation of international, international system. This is ignored as we speak, and I don't think we can dream about reforming the system unless, once again, each and every member of this, com of this community is behaving by rules. So that's the, that's the challenge, I think, uh, for the future. But I do understand you here in this region, in the Indo-Pacific region, when you look from the distance at this war, it might seem as a, as a local kind of conflict, but I I'm using this opportunity to uh, to appeal to you and to ask you to understand that there is a potential of escalation of this conflict. It cannot be against the West. The West cannot be against the rest when the very principles are ruined, when the when international law is is breached. It cannot be against. We must stand united and oppose this reckless behavior. Yeah, thank you very much, Ivan. I saw Tanya Lakshmi, you were uh, discussing uh, while Ivan was uh, speaking, you agree with him? Or you, you have some uh, yeah, I things just, to add? I, I mean, I couldn't agree more, but I was at the same time reflecting 
saying responsible behavior, which of course opens the question, what does it mean, responsible behavior and how to define it? I know what you meant, but I think there are so many nuances of how someone would reflect on responsible behavior. And of course, certain rules have to be respected, but some could understand it completely different. Um, it's more, you know, psychological question, I would mm. say, and that is what we were discussing, because it's a good triggering, but how to have a mechanism then to say, yes, this is a responsible behavior. In each war or um, in each conflict, you have either the aggressor, you have a victim, you have always a, a, a force that strives for power, for water, for natural resources, for more wealth. And uh, this is definitely not a responsible mm. behavior. Mm. But then how to react? I yeah. mean, it was just more a, you know, a reflection. A thought, a how, thought, how a to thought process. Lakshmi? Back to... Um, this whole issue of institution and then the behavior of the actors, how this institution like this UN Security Council, how as you said it can pass an impartial and objective judgment and how it can get compliance. Because I think what is the, the problem with, I'm again coming back to reform, a reformed UN Security Council, hopefully, will also do away with the uh, anachronism of the veto, which doesn't fit in with any concept of sovereign equality of states. So once you don't have the veto, once you have an expansion which is representative, there is uh, you know, and, and the other countries, many times I'm asked, so what will happen if it is expanded? But when it is expanded, you bring in the kind of capabilities and responsibilities and, and uh, perspectives which can be a bridging, which has a bridging effect in terms of uh, the divisions that may be. So basically what so, you... And, and disciplining effect. Yeah. Basically, what you are saying that, uh, turning back to, to the discussion, responsible behavior of uh, P5 nations would be to uh, basically uh, decide to move away from the veto. And oh. also expand and, you know, have this larger, it's like the G20. Yeah, yeah. You have a larger uh, grouping of countries who will represent, you know, no, no taxation without representation, no peace and no compliance without representation yeah. is also an issue. And no effectiveness, sustainability of peace. All of those things are linked to reform. So mm -hmm. it's not a self-serving agenda of some countries. Mm -hmm. It is something that is absolutely necessary. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kocha, you want to, to mention something and then we turn to Ivan. Yeah, um, very quickly. I wanted to make the point that, first, in Africa, we like to be very pragmatic with situations. It is okay to expect everybody to behave responsibly, but the reality is that there will always be bad boys in the class. There will always be people who want to go out of the rules and do things if they know they'll get away with it. And that is why the global institutions need to be more responsive and need to be quick in response and effective in response, because not everybody will behave properly. And in being quick in response and effective in response, a few things come to mind. First of all, the arrangements for decision making today make it impossible for tough decisions to be made in good time. Where you have the same people who are at the forefront of creating the problems, having veto power, they will obstruct every decision that needs to be made to resolve the very problems that they are solving. Number two, you are having challenges that are coming from the left side of the field. Non-state actors getting heavily involved in what these institutions were traditionally set up to address, security and other matters. You're having all of these 
you know, side groups, terrorist groups, etc., participating in that. If you don't have a decision-making mechanism that can confront that, but it's still limited to dealing with state actors, the global bodies will not be able to respond to that. Number three, the underlining factors also need to be dealt with. In one particular situation, you may have an unjust aggression of one country. In my part of the world, for example, the security challenges that we are facing are driven more by climate change and economic conditions. How are these global platforms helping respond in quick time to these? If you don't and you expect everybody to behave in the right manner, people are rather going to take a cue from the dividends that the bad boys are getting from their bad behavior. And there's going to be a lot more turbulence in the world than there is currently. Thank you very much, uh, Kojo. Ivan, you wanted to mention something? Uh, one minute, because then we, no, I, uh, we go to the questions. No, I, I realized when, when Tanya uh, jumped in and said, what is responsible behavior? I mean, I'm, I'm not foreign minister anymore, but I still have my view. So for the audience, I can tell you what is the opposite of responsible behavior. It was what we saw here yesterday uh, and listened to, to Minister Lavrov. This is the opposite of responsible behavior because he keeps on trying to justify and legitimize unprovoked war. He is, he is in a position to tell you, you know, the, the stories and legends and myths by which they want to say that they have a legitimate right to invade a country and it, they even are selling this act as an act of self-defense. So this is the opposite mm -hmm. of self-behavior. I totally agree with my distinguished colleague from, from Ghana. From your perspective, you expect simply more from international institutions to help you deal and tackle with your problems. And sometimes those problems on African continent, elsewhere in the world, are existential problems, climate change and so on. We, we can deliver on that without, uh, without institutions. From a perspective of a small country, uh, as Slovakia is, Slovenia, for example, the, the lack of efficacy, efficiency of international system is compensated on our side by our membership in regional institutions. So that's why for us, unfortunately, being in a position that we see a global system not functioning well, we are lucky enough on European continent, we've got this option of becoming member of European Union, which multiplies, you know, which which compensates uh, basically uh, for for our limited resources when it comes to the size and impact of our, our country. We are stronger together, and similarly, when it comes to defense and and security, it is a collective defense we are part of. So. This is the way how we smaller states are trying to make our voice uh, heard on international scene in this situation of very unstable, unpredictable world. And when we still don't have something which I would call a dream of my, my distinguishing Indian colleague, kind of supranational institutions, which would be in a position to provide a, a, a fair judgment. Uh, and by that, we can then prevent such tragedies uh, happening as is in Ukraine and so many tragedies that happened before. And unfortunately, in this non-functioning system, we are bound to see again uh, similar tragedies. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, okay, we have uh, five more minutes. Uh, this means uh, two very quick uh, questions. I'm looking at uh, the young fellows again because they're already standing with the prepared question. So please. My question is directed to the distinguished uh, panelists for their erudite uh, contribution to this um, conference, um, particularly to the Honorable Minister of Information, Ghana. Um, I wanted to ask this question. Given the global turbulence of insecurity in Africa and the world, what step has been taken to address this issue in terms of multilateralism and um, uh, merging the ideas together? And also, are there any rules, regulation? in place that are responsive and impactful to address this issue. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you very much. OK, we take another one. Uh, my name is Vivian Omariba from Kenya. I work with the Ministry of uh, Finance and Economic Planning. Uh, my question goes to uh, Mr. Kojo for Africa. Um, when trying to uh, 
solve uh, conflict and uh, come up with a uh, ADR that is a uh, alternative dispute resolutions for uh, Kenyan oh sorry for the African governments which is the best approach really is it uh, the bottom up approach or uh, the top down approach because uh, in my experience I feel like uh, top down creates more of uh, you know um, conflict especially at the local level and also people uh, tend to be resentful. So between top down and uh, bottom up, which is the best approach for conflict resolution? Thank you. Probably both at the same time. Uh, do we have one more question? Okay, quickly. Um, the architecture is flawed. The Security Council certainly, and yet India was just there. Ghana is there right now. Slovenia is making the case to be there. My name, by the way, is Owen Maxweeny, and I'm Irish, a young fellow working at the UN in New York. My question is, how do you see the scope for elected members to make an impact at that table now? imperfect as it is. Thank you. That's a million dollar question. Okay, we go, <laughs> we go uh, first to uh, Kojo and then uh, I would ask uh, each of you to uh, reflect on the last uh, question. You have one minute, all of you. Yeah, two quick uh, responses. So for example, in West Africa, um, we've created what we call the Accra Initiative, which is a security platform allowing West African states to better coordinate intelligence sharing because we observe that the major security challenges we are facing are no longer against conventional states trying to attack another state, but they are driven more by non-state actors that for various reasons, extremism, etc., are destabilizing uh, states. And it is important to get a deeper wedge into intelligence sharing and response to deal with it. And for the first time, you're having West African states share a lot more intelligence on a regular basis so that we're able to better respond and better uh, you know, tackle some of these non-conventional uh, actions that are happening in that um, area. The expectation is that you can then escalate that into a set of rules at the continental level and deal with this new security threat that we are facing uh, at that level. In addition to how we are dealing with uh, uh, efforts at undermining democracies, etc., as part of our security challenges there. What works better? That's a question from Kenya, bottom up or top down? I think the easiest answer to give will say a mixed method. Uh, but I actually believe a mixed method works for two reasons. Number one, you need to mix the legitimate concerns of the people who are thought to be at the bottom or the people who are involved in all of these um, um, turbulent activities with the norms that the so-called people at the top are trying to bring to bear. You cannot bring about peace and stability just by forcing some norms on people, when indeed at the bottom, their truth or their belief of some um, you know, discrimination or some infringements exist. And so you need to find an approach that not just listens to them or, or not just hears them, but listens to them and seeks to address some of the concerns they may have while you mix that with whatever bottom lines or norms that you believe from the top must be imposed in these areas. Those will be my responses. Great. Uh, Lakshmi? Very uh, importantly, I think it's important uh, to, it, it must be seen that the UN peace and security mandate covers three pillars. And that's where, you know, it's both bottom up and top down. Um, three pillars. Conflict prevention, early warning conf conflict prevention, peacemaking, that is mediation and peacemaking, peacekeeping and peace building. The second aspect is disarmament, particularly weapons of mass destruction, but also other aspects of disarmament. Even in peace situations in, in on the ground, you have this whole issue. And then the third is counterterrorism. So in all of this, you need the norms, as you mentioned, you need the institutions at different levels, at the global level and effective instit institutions at the regional level and at the national and local levels. So I think it has to be a combination of all three. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Lakshmi, because I see Shub is already standing and always afraid when he uh, stands up. So Tanya, please. Um, I can just very briefly say, because it was a lot about the reform of UN, um, Slovenia has always been, or the UN has always been a natural environment for us. 
And what I sincerely believe is that we have to work towards more inclusive UN and be more proactively engaged with each and every member state with a dialogue and based on solidarity. And this comes back that we have to have a complete picture, understand, listen to each other and hear each other. So I can just say to be a fair broker at the table or an honest broker at the table and really bring down inequalities, respect the international law, the rules that belongs to it, I think this is crucial for the world order, that we don't have pieces in peace. And that, yes, I do agree, it requires responsible behavior, not to understand wrong. It's just the question whether then we are able and capable to apply these rules on those that are behaving irresponsible. And currently, we are failing. So I wish us all more courage, and that goes hand in hand, not only politics, but also business, big corporations that don't follow national interests, but they go beyond, they follow economic interests. But we all have also our moral duty to respect citizens, and take care for well, their well-being and dignity. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Safrian. Yeah. 30 um, seconds. Short, short answer. Imperfect system will have imperfect um, uh, results. So uh, we need to, to work uh, towards the improvement of, of the security. Thank you very much. And last word to Ivan. I, I will make it very short. Slovenia and Slovakia, sometimes, you know, they, they're mixing up. <laughs> two countries. Therefore, I want to entirely subscribe to the concluding remarks of my distinguished colleague and friend, Tania Fayon, uh, and add to it that in addition to our effort to make the international system more functioning and more resilient, we too individually have homeworks to do in, in our respective countries. And here, especially, when it comes to the need to make our democratic systems or democratic governance more resilient to all the challenges we are facing domestically and internationally. Because don't forget the tensions on international scene, which then end up in wars and, and conflicts. Very often the source of the tension comes from within and we need to strengthen our democracies and our governance at home. And nobody will deliver instead of us on that. Thank, Thank you. you very much for these uh, last words uh, with this. And, uh, you know, we could be debating this for, for hours, but uh, we need to close. Uh, Shub is already there. Uh, I would like to thank uh, our panelists. I think they deserve a warm applause. <laughs>